My dear beloved in Christ, the normal means that God uses to implant and to develop a virtue in us is by permitting attacks and temptations against it. Hence, when God permits us to be tempted in any field, he does so that the virtue which is assaulted may develop and become perfect. This is a truth that's not easy to admit since we hold to the belief that temptations are for the purpose of destroying virtue. But this is not so. God permits them only that virtues may increase. Hence, when God wishes that a person should distinguish himself in any virtue, he increases attacks and unlooses terrible and persistent temptations against the virtue, says Bishop Luis Martinez in his wonderful book, Secrets of the Interior Life. Evidently, the temptations under discussion are those that God permits, not those that a soul seeks through its own imprudence, such as exposing itself to voluntary and dangerous occasions of sin. My dear and beloved in Christ, in our effort to love and serve God, we find that temptation is inevitable. We face it daily, but especially during the hot summer months when so much indecency meets the eye. The devil goes about seeking whom he may devour, and the world envelops us with its corrupting seductions and spirit, which is so opposed to the supernatural life. We cannot avoid all temptations, for it often occurs independent of our will. God has declared that those who endure temptation without exposing themselves to it are blessed. This is because by being faithful to God, we receive the crown of life. It's necessary to understand how temptations occur so that we can best be on our guard against them. They are, as Father James Meyer writes, those temptations which, we, which can be called sneak temptations. They can be serious or minor matters. They occur more or less abruptly, even violently, but with God's help we can turn from them, fight them off, Pray them aside. My dearly beloved in Christ, then there are those certain temptations which do not reveal themselves at first for the evil that they are and the evil they lead to. But they are of such a nature that when the crucial and dangerous stage is reached in them, one has no desire to fight them and thus falls prey to them. These are the temptations to which many willingly expose themselves. These temptations rise from dangerous occasions and spiritually dangerous company keeping and even from certain forms of education and classes which endanger and often kill one's faith and virtue. Many young adults and even older persons find that when they place themselves in such situations, they're too weak to fight against this type of temptation and most often succumb to its evil. The reason for this is because this type of temptation lies essentially at the beginning of its course and must be stopped there. Otherwise, it's too late. Once swept along the way of temptation, many find the great moral strength which is needed to fight it is lacking. Too often, when warned of the danger of bad company keeping, many young adults think they can handle it. Sadly, in the end, they find themselves hopelessly weak and unable to resist. Virtue is lost, and even in many cases, the faith itself. It's also tragic to see that some want their own selfish desires to such a point that they don't care where they will lead and will have them at the expense of virtue, seriously endangering their mortal souls. To willingly place yourself in such near occasions of mortal sin is your own fault and is seriously wrong. These temptations are not sudden ones, but are brought about by your own choice. They must be avoided at all costs or will likely contribute to the loss of your mortal soul and everlasting torment in hell. The so-called sneak temptations are the ones which frequent us the most. We should never be discouraged on account of their frequency and extent as long as we are watchful 
and do not will them in any way. It's the action of our will that God regards. St. Paul tells us, God is faithful and will not permit you to be tempted beyond your strength, but with the temptation will also give you a way out that you may be able to bear it. God's grace is what helps us to surmount temptation, but we must ask for his help. There are certain measures we must take in order to fight against temptation. First, we must immediately turn from it, reject it at once, and humbly acknowledge the fact that we can do nothing without God. We need his help in order to avoid sin. When we distrust ourselves and realize we cannot fight this alone, we should immediately turn to God in prayer. We need not take time to form long prayers. The quickest and best way is to simply pronounce the holy names of Jesus and Mary repeatedly. This is about all there's really time for when confronted with temptation. If the temptation is extremely violent, longer aspirations can be used, such as, Oh God, I will rather die than offend thee. Oh Jesus, help me. Mary, my mother, assist me. Frequent confession and Holy Communion are extremely helpful. It's of great importance to reveal our temptations to our confessor so that we can get practical help in the matter. St. Philip Neri said, A temptation revealed is half overcome. More than anything else, frequent Holy Communion strengthens us to resist temptations. In the society in which we live, and especially during this time of the year, temptations against the virtue of chastity abound. Devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary and consecration to her are invaluable aids in preserving the virtue of purity. Along with such devotion, it's essential to practice custody of the eyes. Indecency has become so rampant that this is true for both men and women. My dearly beloved in Christ, nearly all the passions that assail us have their origin in the unrestrained liberty of the eyes. For as a rule, it's our unguarded looks that lead us to commit sin. The saints realized this fact and commented on it. St. Augustine says, from the look proceeds the thought, and from the thought, the evil desire. The devil tempts us first to look, then to desire, and at last to consent. St. Jerome adds, the devil needs, on our part, only a beginning. It's enough if we only half open the door for him. He will then force it open all the way. St. Francis de Sales says he does not wish the enemy to force his way into the fortress, must keep the gates locked. Brother Roger, a Franciscan who was noted for his exceptional purity and custody of the eyes, said, If a man shuns the occasion of sin, God will protect him. If he deliberately puts himself in danger, the Lord abandons him and he easily falls into grievous sin. Due to the prevalent evil in our society, our eyes are allured by countless spiritual dangers surrounding us. More than ever before, we must practice custody or mortification of the eyes. St. Francis de Sales stated, it's not so much the casual glance, but rather the intentional gaze or lustful stare that's sinful. My dear and beloved in Christ, you must guard your eyes from indecent websites, movies, video games, magazines, television programs, and commercials. In order to strengthen their will against temptation, the saints denied themselves the satisfaction of looking even at innocent objects, which were of interest to them. This doesn't have to be all the time, but perhaps when you feel most drawn, drawn to look at them. In this way, it'd be a greater sacrifice. For example, you might see a person walking a beautiful dog and you really want to get a good look at it, but look away in order to keep your eyes under control of the will. If a fabulous sports car drives by and you want to take a good look at it, you can avoid doing so and offer that up. If a jet flies by and you want to watch it streaking across the sky, you can turn your eyes away from it in order to train them to respond to your will. 
daily, depending on your interests, you can find occasions to mortify your eyes in such ways and many others. You can mortify your eyes so you'll have the strength to look away when you're tempted to stare at spiritually dangerous objects. My dearly beloved in Christ, needless to say, especially during the summer, we must definitely and immediately turn our eyes away from anyone wearing scandalous and indecent attire. Any liberty which we give our eyes can not only endanger, endanger our soul, but can also become a problem when we try to say our prayers. Such distractions will re-enter the mind and deprive us of the proper concentration and recollection on our prayers. The devil will also use the evil images we have seen and present them again before us as a repeated source of temptation. Therefore, we must be careful to direct our gaze to objects that will lead us to God and not away from him. I'll conclude with the following story. St. Anthony of Egypt taught his followers that we are often the cause of our own temptations. He relates, One day there was a very loud knocking on the door of the monastery. When I opened it, there stood a man of enormous size. Very frightened, I asked who he was. I am Satan. And what do you want here? I want to know why you monks and all Catholics are always cursing me. They have good reason to curse you, wicked spirit, for you're always laying snares for them to lead them into sin. Well, I'm not so much to blame as you think. Men lead themselves into sin by seeking the occasions of sin, though they know they will probably fall. Catholics can easily overcome me if they use the spiritual weapons they have. So why blame me when they lose their souls? I said, Lord Jesus Christ, I thank thee that thou hast overcome the devil and given help to thy servants. As soon as Satan heard that holy name, he vanished completely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.